out and I'm here for the the hour uh, that we have is to really be able to show you uh, what we've recently brought to market in terms of new features to the core content services platform that we have within Microsoft 365. Um, so I know that this is a probably potentially a mixed audience and there's some Azure folks that are there too. And this is actually a really good topic um, to include uh, that uh, experience in as well, because if folks have been kind of watching what's going on in the cloud here lately, um, there's been a ton of investment by us at Microsoft um, in cognitive services and artificial intelligence and machine learning at the core platform level within Azure. And what the focus of this presentation is going to show is the advances that we've made in taking those capabilities, which Azure folks could kind of use as building blocks for their own applications, but Microsoft themselves are using those building blocks in our own tools. So this is, if you will, more of a SaaS or software as a service approach to bringing some of those uh, AI and machine learning algorithms to, to where the content is for a lot of organization that's stored in Microsoft Teams and SharePoint sites and OneDrive and so forth. So um, I'm not a, usually that big of a guy that tends to talk to a couple slides, but I think it's just worth kind of setting up the problem, if you will. So you see here a couple different pains that uh, customers have been giving us feedback on. Uh, certainly the, the, the biggest uh, change there has simply been the volume of data that people have been putting into our cloud services. Uh, you know, it continues to be exponential growth in the amount of content that people are creating. Um, but then being able to get kind of rationalize that content and get governance around that content is becoming more arduous for organizations. So the net of this presentation is, can we bring those AI and machine learning algorithms trained by humans, right, to be able to help us deal with the problem of making sure that our services don't turn into the landfills that file shares were um, for decades. And in particular, uh, the three areas that I'm going to be focused on is uh, content processing, content understanding, and, and sort of content governance. To give you an idea of what kind of this looks like uh, from an architecture perspective, uh, kind of dealing up to this, I'm, like I said, uh, I find it easier to demo than I do to talk to slides, but uh, Project Cortex, if you will, is an umbrella term that we use for the different um, ways of research and preview features that we've been investigating with with customers over the last couple of years. Um, now, SharePoint Syntax is actually the first product that has been released out of that effort. So think of Project Cortex as a larger umbrella and SharePoint Syntax as something specific. Um, and in particular, if, if I drill into this a little bit, uh, SharePoint Syntax is the content services piece pillar that's there, so the pillar B. Uh, if you will, and is going to be focused on doing, um, you know, metadata extraction and analysis of content. There is a whole nother category A around here, which is knowledge curation and discovery. Um, and I'll be able to show you some of that, that we're dogfooding currently internally towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but that con that actual pillar has yet to be released and will come out towards the end of this calendar year, the, the beginning of next. Um, but it's much more around, um, my demo is going to be much more focused on the pieces that just became generally available last month in commercial tenants um, in that content services pillar. Um, everything that's underlying this is the graph. Um, and you might actually think of you know, the Microsoft graph uh, with all of those different signals and relating your content and your users and all of that as being things that we recognized early on as being a unique asset within the cloud offering because of features like Delve and stuff like that that we built uh, as part of the launch of Office 365. And this is just kind of expanding that same type of uh, investment in banking on bringing new AI and models to, to those types of services. So again, SharePoint Syntax is the particular product we're gonna spend most of the time uh, here. Uh, there's really uh, two demos that I have for you. Uh, one is uh, content processing and the other is content understanding. The compliance bit is actually uh, related to this and I'll make sure I point that out because I recognize in this area there's a lot of government or, or people who work for, for government and regulated industries um, and being able to tie this to security and governance is, is a pretty important step and it certainly has ties there, it's just it's not the focal point. Um, so, uh, given maybe not everybody um, is an Azure uh, guru, or even if you have played around with, with Azure in terms of building AI models and those type of things, um, it's important to note that there's been evolutions in the ways that those models get built. 
Um, and so if you've had experience with this in the past, you've probably been doing things that are more in the bucket of conventional machine learning algorithms. Um, even something that's still in preview from us, the trainable classifiers in the Security and Compliance Center fall into that category. So if you've been playing with those at all, you notice that there's a large volume of data that you have to provide um, for that model to get generated. And a, again, a large training set that you have to do. Um, the trainable classifiers require just the training portion of that to be 200 items that you reviewed in terms of um, training. You need to provide many more hundreds of that for the actual first build of that model. Um, neither of the demos I'm going to do for you today require that level of effort because we've been moving from just a conventional machine learning model to one that's a little bit more machine teaching oriented. Um, and you're going to see that we're able to bring these things to life with much smaller sample sizes and much smaller amount of training. Making it more realistic, frankly, to be used by a large portion of your organization than just a few people who are in kind of data and engineering. So my, my last slide before we kick off the demos, and a lot of times people get kind of confused between the two demos that I do. The, when you look at what parts of SharePoint syntax you use, uh, there's two main uh, pillars, if you will. One of them is much more focused on dealing with structured documents, like the one we have at the bottom there that looks like a purchase order versus the unstructured documents where there might be a lot of variance in the file format and that's the document understanding model. So um, we're going to start with the easy one with the structured documents first, and then we'll move on to the unstructured ones afterwards. Uh, but there are solutions for both with inside of the SharePoint syntax stack. Any questions before I just start demoing? Pull back up the chat real quick. Nothing in the chat, sir. Nothing in the chat. Awesome. What is um, well, real quick? Ed, what is the release uh, schedule on this? You said mentioned something about commercial. Yeah, so I, I always and again that's a little bit of a habit by me. <laughs> um, it has become generally available for commercial customers already. It, it right. was released in October, um, but of course in this area there's a lot of folks that live in other clouds like uh, mm -hmm. GCC, GCC High, and Department of right. Defense. Um, the FedRAMP process for those is just starting. Uh, so you would anticipate them coming later on, like you know, mid-year 2021. It's okay. just as, not, don't take that as a commitment. That's like right, a ballpark, understood. Right? <laughs> because Fair I don't want to get in trouble. Ed said, right? right? But the, um, the FedRAMP process generally takes months. Right. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Um, so for this example, I thought I would show you a, a lot of the the pieces to it um, from a timing standpoint. But let's start with the end uh, in mind first. So um, I have a bunch of documents. They look like this. Uh, their purchase orders. And what I've identified in the model that I've built, that there's some key pieces of information that I would like to be promoted as metadata, right? Um, and in particular, the actual purchase order date, the purchase order number, who the vendor is, um, who the requisitioner was, uh, the shipping method, and even the total that come out of this. Um, and this is inside of the scenario that we refer to more as forms processing, because it is this document's always going to look this way. Um, and the key pieces of information that I want are generally in the same spot uh, within those files. So if we go back over here, I have a whole bunch of them sitting over here in my library. Let's grab a unique one, which that's always a challenge for me to remember which ones I have dragged on and which ones I have not. So let's do with Johanna. Um, so let's go in and drag that to upload it into the site. You'll notice that I get in the uh, notification there that your file is being analyzed. Right, and once the file has been processed, the page will refresh and go in and it'll actually notice that originally the content type for here is of type document. Um, after it's been analyzed, if it matches as being a file that fits that format, it'll be switched to a purchase order and it'll pull out the key pieces of metadata that are inside of that document, which was a file format PDF, by the way, just in case you didn't notice that as part of it. And that will take a minute to, to happen, but we can uh, you know, try to force the issue here a little bit by refreshing the page and things along those lines. It's not immediate. It is a flow that's running behind the scenes that's doing all of that work. And if it doesn't come up right away, we'll certainly come back uh, to it uh, to see that. It, but you can see the others that are here have had that metadata pulled across. So quick, um, quick, quick question, question, Ed, from a yeah. volume perspective. You know, if hundreds of forms were added simultaneously, 
um, you know, that's going to put some load on uh, 365. Yep. Um, so it is so, an async. It is an asynchronous process. Okay. Um, right. So it does have the ability to scale. Now, when we come back and talk about like licensing of this and all a little bit later, um, mm -hmm. this whole thing is based off of AI Builder being used inside the tenant, which is the part that's actually doing the OCR on the PDFs themselves. And you do with the SharePoint Syntax licensing get a certain amount of capacity for that AI Builder. And I'm not a licensing expert. Right, Correct. but fair enough. Um, do realize that there is a counter um, that you're you're deducting sure. from when these things do run. Makes sense. Thanks. Um, so I thought I'd show you some of how it's constructed. Um, do realize though that there are moments of this that take some time, so we might skip the one that I already have kind of pre-built back and forth, depending on how things are going. Um, but underneath of Power Automate, notice not only do I have the ability to do all the flow work, um, but I have this new option when I install uh, AI Builder. Sorry, install SharePoint syntax that I get an AI builder option. Let's actually start completely from scratch so I don't mess up my demo. Uh, but if I go over to here and let's say I want to create a new model to process forms. Now, again, I'm a big fan of always looking at what's going on in advanced settings. You'll notice that as I create the model, I'm also deciding whether or not I want a, a new content type to be created that maps back into SharePoint. So the way this is being stored behind the scenes, right, is that as I identify what fields I want to be promoted out of the body of those documents, it's going to create different columns inside of a content type. And you can absolutely select an existing one that you might already have created as opposed to doing a new one. Let's go ahead and create one so you can see what the steps look like. And I already have teed up which fields I want to grab. Now, because I create this demo over and over and over again, I like to prefix mine so I don't get my content types um, overlapping each other. Right, so the first thing it's asking me is what information am I going to want to extract from the documents? So let's go ahead and add these in real quick. The customer's name, the vendor, the date. The number, total and shipping. Go ahead and click next. Now it's going to ask me for a collection of documents that it's going to use in order to build the model. So I'll go ahead and upload a few documents. And I'm just going to upload them from local storage. This is actually somewhat faster if you already have this content sitting in SharePoint. Because it would already have been indexed and everything else that makes the process a little bit easier. But just to show you exactly how I built the earlier demo, let's go in and add a handful of these documents. You don't need many. Um, the limit here, if you're looking over there on the right hand side, is you need at least five examples of the document. Um, the, of course, the more examples that you provide and the more training that you do, um, the more accurate that model is going to be. Uh, and especially if you have things that are a bit of variance, when we get to the content understanding, you're going to want to make sure you have enough examples for it to be able to do that determination. Now, this analysis here usually takes like one to two minutes. Um, in, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. It's closer to that one minute piece, but while we're waiting on it, uh, any questions from the group? I, I saw somebody last earlier this year, I guess, um, demo AI cognitive services, Azure cognitive services to do something like this. Is this kind of where yep. this came out of? Yeah, so that's what I was saying earlier is that these types of things you could have done in Azure with the building blocks that are there. And what you see we're doing now is we're taking those same building blocks and making them kind of a turnkey ready-made set of services within the content platform of SharePoint. Yeah, Because right. I mean, believe it or not, over the last um, you know, two years, if you will, I've had a lot of folks that have had customer problems where they've been, they want to use the AI services in Azure, but their content's all stored in Office 365. So they've been doing something like extracting all of it into Azure Blob Storage so they can run all of that analysis and then figure out what it is and put it back. And it's just a really kind of nasty kind of back and forth. So 
Um, this is meant to be like a SaaS based version of that in that the models are uh, and services aren't things that you have to deploy. They're already there. It's just running through this configuration wizard to make it happen. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Right, so now it's, we're kind of- It's in, like the admin center GUI for PowerShell. <laughs> yeah, so now we're kind of in that, that training phase, right? So I can go in and say, all right, um, over here is my vendor. Um, this up here is the date. This is the purchase order number. Um, this over here is my customer. And the total is this number down here. And shipping will be this little bit here. Right, and I have a few documents. Now the good news is, is as I go from one to the other, it's gonna recognize some of them for me right out of the gate. So it's getting better already. So this is my vendor, this is the date, this is the number, and I'll just confirm the other ones that are automatically selected in total and shipping and everything else look good on that document. Go to number three here. This is what you guys really wanted came to see is me just highlighting fields in a PDF, right? Hey, Ed, while you're doing that, if you had wanted the vendor to include all of that vendor information, would you be able to do that here as like a larger field type or would you have yeah. to do vendor name, vendor company, vendor address, et cetera? So I, it's a great question and it really depends on what you, how you want that data stored back into the field as a content type. Um, so it, we do support kind of like uh, multi-valued um, items, uh, but it basically stores it more like a JSON that you might use with a, you know, just basically to a text string that you might use uh, a custom rendering of like, and you see that a lot happening with tables. Like if I actually wanted this whole table to be a single value or a single column that gets promoted, it would basically create a representation of that to a single uh, text column inside of SharePoint. Okay, so it sounds like it, it, for my particular example, it sounds like that would be better served as multiple fields. Um, but the table is a really good example of where you may want to pull the whole thing in as a as a JSON. Yeah, I think a lot of it really depends on how you're planning on using what you get, right? Yeah. Um, so I could certainly get all of this as one large string, but if okay. I wanted it structured, having it in a table with the lines here gives it the visual cues in order to be able to structure it. Okay. Uh, now we have a question from the chat, uh, whether or not will will this work on images? Absolutely, um, and I'll actually show you um, exactly what file types are supported when we look at the workflow that's being generated for us underneath the hood. Um, well, I forget when I'm done, I don't want to mess this up. PO date, <laughs> purchase order number. I'm on my last one. Notice this one here, it wasn't able to pick the name out automatically for me because it was a little smaller than the others, right? So I'm good, all done. And if nothing else, you could be impressed that Ed's willing to do this live in front of you as opposed to just showing you one that I already have canned. Because I want you to get an impression, not the wow, only the wow factor of being able to do this, because in some ways this is like the holy grail of content management since the whole career I've spent working with SharePoint and other document management systems is how can we get users out of the business of having to provide the metadata that we want, right? Um, can we automatically search and pull it up out of the document? And the answer is with these services, can train AI to do it. Uh, the example I'm showing you here is the structured one. We'll get to the unstructured one uh, right after this. But uh, the uh, I, the reason I wanted to show you all of the steps is because I wanted you to understand how much level of effort it takes to build them. Um, and hopefully at the end of the presentation, you'll agree with me that it's it's not that bad at all. And this is certainly something that, uh, a power user within an organization to do, um, not necessarily someone from IT. So our model is training, uh, which it'll just take it a second. Now, we don't actually have to wait for this to finish because there's only two clicks that are left after the model's been trained. And it's basically to publish the model and say that you want the model to be used. Um, and when you say that you would like to use the model, it recognizes that you were targeting SharePoint um, as the original source. So it'll automatically go and build you a workflow using Power Automate to take advantage of the model that was built. So you don't have to know how to do any of this Power Automate stuff yourself. But I thought it would be interesting to see what it built. So this is the one that's running behind the scenes that we just kicked off earlier. And if I go in and click edit, you'll see that the workflow is tied 
to the actual library. So when a, is a file created here, you're going to see the file extensions that it supports. So PDF, PNG, JPEG, and JPEG. So obviously off of images as well as PDF files. Um, the PDF files themselves also do not have to be OCR'd. The actual AI builder will OCR off of an image PDF if you still have people who are generating those. So when a new file gets created, uh, we filter making sure we're only getting access to files that we can process. We then go and get the body of that document, right? And then we send it to AI Builder's predict shape. And out of that prediction, there's a new action uh, inside of Office, uh, inside of Power Automate for SharePoint's connector, which basically says, all right, take the response that I get back from the prediction, which has basically all the different values and the level of confidence and those type of things, and update all the metadata properties of the list item. And if I were to click on the one that we just ran a few minutes ago, you can see when it went through, this is what that results look like. Right, and it's basically the output of this. You know, here's the display name, it's shipping, the value that it found was parcel post and the confidence level was one, which one is 100%. So the values closer to one are much more accurate than ones that are not zero, and then here's the update that went back to that particular file. And I should have definitely stalled well long enough for that to be able to update. So if we go back to purchase orders here, see the new document that we added, it did fill up all of those values as it went across. So that's my end of the first demo. A a any questions related to that one? How does this relate to the, um, the I can't remember the exact name, so forgive me if I'm not making sense. The uh, classifiers used for records management. That's a great question. Um, for this one, it doesn't. Okay. For my next one, it does. <laughs> uh, then um, I will withhold my question. <laughs> right. And the, the, and the reality is, is because so with this form processing model, what I've really done is build a model that's tied to a single library, right? Uh, when you start thinking of classifiers and things that are a little bit more enterprise ready, you're talking about building models that you're going to use at multiple locations. Um, and the content understanding um, scenario falls more into that category. Um, but if you were just to compare, Jay, this to a classifier, um, a classifier in the security and compliance center um, doesn't extract metadata, right? It basically just says, is it of this content type or not? Mm. Right, and then okay. you're going to add a retention label or sensitivity label to it. Yep. Um, and the training model um, is one that's based on machine learning. So you're back in the world of let me provide you 500 documents to build the model off of, and let me provide a set of the 200 to train you off of. And I know all of this because I just spent a whole week building yeah. a single trainable classifier in order to show a customer at the beginning of December. <laughs> yeah, because um, it was really hard. Because we have a we have a customer who's going to use trainable classifiers to, or who wants to use trainable classifiers to automatically categorize their records, um, yeah. and and that's the big concern I have going into that is is you every single type, you need to train and that's two hundred documents. It's setting it up. It's it's a big effort. It's a big lift. And yeah, I'm intrigued by this because you're like you don't need that many documents, and I'm like you really didn't need that many documents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so her, so hold your thought for related to the content center. Now, the content center doesn't equal, um, which is the content understanding solution I'm going to show you next, doesn't okay. equal trainable classifier either, but it's closer. Um, and when you see exactly why, I'll make that connection of how does this relate to security and compliance kind of at the end. Cool. Um, but yeah, but this solution here it is definitely targeted towards kind of that power user because it's using the power platform in terms of AI builder. And one could argue that you could have built the solution I just showed you yourself if you were educated enough in the power platform and AI builder to do it. Uh, the difference here is just how easy it is in terms of all of the wiring being done for you. Um, that when you go in and say what you want to get out of the documents, it automatically creates the content type. It automatically changes the view of the library. And then when you click publish, you don't have to build that workflow. That workflow is going to be built for you, and it's going to automatically write that data back to the library accordingly. Yeah, we've had a team of six programmers creating a basic AI to 
do a one page form, you know, 30 or 40 fields inside of it, but still, and they've been working on it for 11 months and they got another month ago. And it's like, yeah, I can do that for you in about a day. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten to the point now where that both of these demos that you're seeing here, I can build in under 30 minutes from scratch um, because I've done it a lot because uh, I've been doing trial tenants, right? And then throwing them away after the trials run out. Um, hopefully I, I get some official licensing that I don't have to keep repeating that behavior. This is not labor intensive at all. Um, and you yeah, have the I mean, benefit of all I, the UI, right? That you yeah. get from SharePoint that you don't have if you're just dealing with Azure, you have to build your own uh, interface to that repository. Yeah, that was the that was the part that was like stopping me when the AI cognitive with the Azure cognitive services apart because he was like, okay, and now you got to do all this JSON stuff, and I was like, yeah, I don't know. Now I don't have to. Um. So all right. So the 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 second example that's here, um, is a new. So when you install the SharePoint syntax licensing into the tenant, it asks you as part of the general setup to create a content center. Um, so think of Content Center almost like Content Type Hub, right? As a place where content types are being created. The difference is, is that this is focused on your models that you're going to use within the enterprise. Um, and this is much more in the arena of document understanding. So this is something we're going to be able to use across multiple libraries, across multiple site collections, and we're going to be able to use it on unstructured documents, not just the highly structured ones that you saw earlier. Um, so to do this, you can go in and create a model. Now, um, I've already created one. I'm just going to walk you through the, the bit that's here. Um, but you'll notice that because it's not structured, uh, there's a little bit of a difference in the way that you go through and um, actually build the model and highlight it. So what I have here is a bunch of different statement of works or, or, or the, actually it's a combination of statement of works and um, benefit change notifications. And I've created a model where I will have some key pieces of information that I would like to be promoted as metadata anytime the system comes across an actual contract benefit change document. So very similar uh, type of flow in that you, we're basically gonna add files, we're then gonna figure out what we're gonna extract, and then we're gonna build a classifier which will help identify that it is of type uh, benefit change in terms of the document. So inside of this, uh, you can go in and add uh, documents. Uh, again, you can add documents from already existing SharePoint sites or upload new ones. I already have some training files that have already imported into this model. Notice the, the piece of information that's up here that's a, a bit different than the last one that we had in that this model, because you might actually, when you publish this out, have multiple models working on the same library, it wants to make sure that you provide negative examples as well as positive ones. Right, because it's going to be monitoring a library and not all of the content that's there might be of this particular type of file. So I have a whole set of them. Uh, the next step in doing um, working with these documents is to focus on what pieces of data are you going to extract out of it? Um, and I have two. Um, I'll show you what these documents look like and how these uh, extractors are built. Uh, basically, each of these documents have a, an insurance provider that's referred to inside of the text and a date that that benefits change will be effective of. Um, so if I drill into these extractors, I walk through a similar wizard where I can basically label, train, and then test the algorithms that I have for finding it. Now, what you're seeing here is not the actual physical document. You're seeing searches representation of that document. So when search indexes and crawls it, Right, what's the text that's extracted? Because that's the text that we need to be able to operate on. The document is actually has a lot more structure to it than this. But the way this works is you just simply go through and you only need a handful. You notice I've only done like five of them and already I've, I've labeled enough files to be able to train. But this is as simple as going in and picking a particular file, going in and saying, all right, the insurance provider in this case is humongous insurance. So I'll highlight that, right? And then click next to go on to the next one. So very similar to the last uh, process where I was going and picking fields. Now I'm highlighting text strings um, and I have a couple documents where I've chosen the option that there is no label. So once you've done that, it basically it built a very basic algorithm, uh, which is its best guess without any more help on being able to pull that particular insurance provider information out. And what it'll report back is a certain level of confidence out of the gate. Um, now, you're seeing that I'm getting a 
percent accuracy because I've added some other hints already. When I first built this model, um, it was only at about 60% accurate and it wasn't getting matches for the things that I highlighted. So I needed to give it some more help. And these helps are in terms of explanations. Think of these as hints of this, of giving the system some additional information that helps it identify where in that body of text that particular corporation's name might be. And so there's all different types of explanations. You can certainly build them from blank or, or do a bunch of templates. Temp there are built-in templates for being able to pull pulling dates, especially different formatted ones, numeric versus kind of all written out dates, phone numbers, zip codes, first words of a sentence, social security numbers, email addresses, all of that kind of stuff are some templates that you can just work from. Mine were much more simple than that. I went in and just added an explanation, said, well, um, I need an explanation saying the string before that this phrase always precedes the token that I'm looking for, this A datum corporation. I don't care about the capitalization of it. Just if you see this, the next thing that you're going to get is probably that. Um, and then I also added one that said, well, the string after the piece of information I'm looking for is going to have some type of URL in it inside of the content that we're working on. And by the way, the proximity between those two things has to be at least five tokens. And the token is basically a, a, a pattern or a set of strings you know, that's continuous you know, without any spaces or punctuation. So basically saying, find the piece of information that's in between those two phrases. And that was enough to get it to 100%, right? So notice it has all of the different matching that's here. If I show you, let's go back um, to the actual model here and show you the other uh, change date extractor that I have. Notice here that I went in and I highlighted this as of, right? But some of these other statement of works do have dates in them, and they even have the words as of being some of those dates. So this is one that took a little bit more, you know, noodle scratching, if you will, of how am I going to get this to realize that that's not an effective date because this isn't a benefits change. It just happens to be a statement of work. So when I went in to add explanations of there, I, I really kind of cheesed out. I said, well, first thing, you're looking for a date. This was simply using one of those templates that gave me all of those different uh, expressions, ways that dates could be generated. But then I said, hey, the string before that is as of. And by the way, make sure you get exact capitalization because all of my benefits, that's the leading paragraph and a leading sentence. Right. So, and that capitalization is what got rid of some of those other uh, values being pulled out. Comments so far? So what I've shown you here is the difference in going and pulling out key pieces of information of documents that aren't structured. Uh, the last piece of this demo is basically to go in and train a classifier. And the classifier is just a yes, no question. Is this document one that you care to match to this type or not in the model? So you go through, you enter a couple positive, you enter a couple negative, and you're good to go. So the biggest difference is, Jay, and this is related to your question, right, is that now that I have a model, I can designate places where it can be used right now. Unlike trainable classifiers that you can actually just go and tell them to hunt, you know, look through my entire tenant. These models, at least today in their release, you have to go and publish them so that they then start taking over operation of particular libraries. So I could go in and say, you know, look in a particular document library and click add. And now all the documents that get uploaded, the model will examine them, see if the classifier matches. And if it does, go in and start extracting that data. There is one other thing that I haven't shown you yet, and so if I click up model settings, there's retention label. So in addition to doing that extraction, uh, we do have built-in support at GA, at General automatically applying a retention label. Um, and this is honestly with most of the customers that I work with, this is the big win, because people are dumping a bunch of content and having some, some other system be able to look at that, extract the key metadata values out of it, and set the retention policy, right? Is a, is a, a, and with a little bit more of a fine tooth comb, if you will, by looking in certain repositories than the trainable classifiers. Um, eventually, you will also see something like sensitivity labels being added here. So we could integrate this with Microsoft Information Protection and possibly have the files being encrypted and things along those lines, but it's a little bit more roadmap, um, the retention label shipped as part of general availability.
So to finish this demo, and then I'll take some questions, that means that when you get a library like this and you've uploaded a bunch of documents to it, all I have to do is change the view to be able to show you, yep, it extracted out those insurance providers and those dates, and I actually am getting the confidence scores to go along with that, with how confident was the system in making that data extraction. Comments, questions, criticisms? Hey Ed, that that search is um, it's the it's the standard search, right? So you can't designate looking in a header or a footer versus the body. Uh, no, you cannot. Okay. At least not that I've come up with, unless there's some way of looking at that search index from a content perspective and using some of those explainers to look for. But but no, <laughs> I have not tried. No. This is all pretty slick. Thank you. Um, hopefully the demos are coming across. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So those those were the two, right? And that that has shifted, right? Um, and I'll talk about licensing a little bit at the end. I always save the the stuff for the end that everybody asks. Uh, but that is SharePoint syntax. And if you deploy it, I'm using a. Uh, this is not a dog food tenant. This is generally available commercial trial tenant that I stood up. Um, if you add SharePoint syntax trials to it. Um, just a little bit of a, a caveat there. Um, SharePoint Syntax, if you were to buy it for an enterprise, would also come with AI builder credits. Um, but if you're just doing this to play around and you're only adding the SharePoint Syntax trial, you're only adding a trial that's 25 users. And that's not enough of a threshold for that package to also include AI builder credits. So if you want to build these demos yourself, what I, a way around that that I found is to also add the the RPA trials. Um, RPAs are the robotic process automations, you know, the, the features of Power Automate that include the ability to automate the browser and things like that. If you add that trial in addition, that will give you enough AI builder credit to be able to build these demos. Um, would not be a problem doing this at an enterprise level, but if you're doing this just as yourself, playing with only one or two users, um, the SharePoint syntax license by itself, the trialing mechanism doesn't give you the licensing credit. Um, I want to show you one thing that's a little bit more uh, coming of age, though, um, and this is a kind of in that knowledge arena where we are going. Uh, and stuff that will be released uh, again more towards the end of this calendar year, the beginning of next calendar year, and that is uh, more within that knowledge pillar of Project Cortex as opposed to the content processing stuff you've seen lately. And this is around topic extraction. So those of you that are Azure nuts, right? put your Azure uh, hat back on, and you know that inside of Cognitive Services, there's a, a service that allows it to process a, a document or a web page or something along those lines and do key term extraction, right? These are all the pieces of information, whether they be people or projects, products, or name things that are look like it's important into that content. So we care about that as well, because what we've recognized is that um, though organizations have a lot of content, they don't necessarily have a lot of knowledge. Um, and so what we're doing is bringing those types of services to be able to operate on the content inside of M365 as well. So as a uh, search and the graph and things operate on that data, you'll be able to match it back to, let's say something very similar to like a term set in the managed metadata service of key things that you care about as an enterprise. And from that, it will generate a wiki to be able to show you, here's all the knowledge assets that relate back to those terms. So that was a long explanation. Let me show it to you in action. So this is a page, a, just a plain old SharePoint page that got generated by the fact that I published a demo um, earlier this week. I built a Power App to be able to highlight some of the features of the Surface Duo devices that we have. Um, and it, it put up a nice little text explanation and a couple links to my video. But one thing I didn't do when I created this page is I didn't make that Surface Duo a hyperlink. So inside of our Microsoft tenant, Surface Duo, it being one of our first party devices, is one of those terms that we care about. So if I highlight over that, it's gonna pull up not a people card, which you might expect if I was highlighting a person, but a topic card. And these topic cards basically give me insights into you know, an explanation of what the Surface Duo is, who are some key people that are involved in that, and then even um, some resources that I might be talking about that particular term or that particular device. I could give the system feedback since I'm the author of that content as to whether or not this is truly relevant to the Surface Duo. Um, but if I click view details, right, actually I've already opened this up at a tab. 
this takes me to another new site um, type that we've, we're introducing as part of Project Cortex, and it's referred to as a knowledge center. So think of knowledge center almost as like Wikipedia for those topics that you care about. But unlike Wikipedia, where you're crowdsourcing it being written out, the, the system is using the AI to automate and curate the content that your publishers can just pin to these pages. So these are still SharePoint pages, so you could certainly author them. Um, but notice that it has a bit of a description. There is could certainly connect me with different people in the organization. And then here's content that uh, was recommended by the system and approved by the curators of this page uh, as being content that's related to Surface Duo stored inside of the tenant. And of course, this still security trims because it's content that's being stored inside of SharePoint, OneDrive, or Microsoft Teams. So I'm only going to see recommendations that I am uh, eligible to be able to see. This is a little bit more preview. This is not something you can run yet today with SharePoint Syntax, but I thought I would do both for you given the time over lunch to be able to chat. Any questions on that piece? No, that is seriously cool. Yeah, and uh, we and we have shown both publicly. Um, so I will make sure I get these slides to Jay. But um, there are some videos here at the end of different blog announcements and videos and um, different keynotes that happen as part of Ignite that you can go out and watch if you want to see more demos. I'll be honest, if you watched any of those Ignite sessions, um, they tend to show you the big bang at the end. They don't show you the how, and that's why when I did this call, I wanted to show you actually building uh, that form processing model. Um, the, the, the packaging piece that's here, because people always ask this question, and this is my last bit, and, and I'll stop for some more questions. Um, but SharePoint syntax is not included in M365 E3 or E5 even. It's something that's an add-on, right? It's priced per user. Um, so again, it has its own trial. If you want to add it to an Office 365 trial, you certainly can. Um, the one note is that if you are buying this in an enterprise, if you get at least 300 users, it's what comes with a large bucket of those AI builder credits that are needed for those forms processing models to work. Um, but if, so if you're doing this on your trial, you actually need to add two trials to your tenant to be able to build the same demos I showed you. And the easiest other trial I've thought to add is the Power Automate with RPA. Phew. That was a action-packed hour there, Jay. Um, That's impressive. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm done demo-wise. I'm happy to kind of stop sharing my screen, take any other questions, put the video back on, chat with the group, whatever. Anybody has anything they want to do? <laughs>